Hey you guys, it's Vilma from Vilma Iris Blog. Today I am answering your questions, questions that you guys have submitted via Instagram, through my group in the Vixens, or different emails and comments that I have gotten um, throughout. We're going to do a few, or maybe uh, seven or so today, and then if you guys uh, like this, we can continue doing it as a series and you guys can ask me um, questions on anything that you want to talk about. So um, I'm going to go ahead and get started so that we don't waste any time. The first question that I got are, do you have any tips for starting your own blog? Um, and I do. So the first thing that I think that you need to ask yourself is, what kind of blog do you want to be? What do you want your brand to stand for? And be really, really thoughtful about that because there are a lot of blogs out there, but you really want to ask yourself, what do I really want to be good at? What do I want to be known for? What do I want my brand to stand for? And so for me, for example, when I started my book blog, I wanted to be really good at writing reviews. I wanted to be a really good professional review blog. And so that's kind of where I got started. Um, and that helped kind of define my mission and my platform and my plan um, for what I wanted my blog to be. Now there are a lot of blogs out there so I think the next question to ask yourself is how do you want to differentiate yourself? Now that you know what you want to stand for, are there other blogs that are similar and how can you differentiate yourself from them? Is it in your voice? Is it in how you approach whatever it is that you're doing? Is it um, who you network with or how you talk uh, or what audience you address, you know, how do you differentiate yourself from what's already out there so that you are valuable to the people that um, you're trying to talk to. And I think from there, it's really very slowly starting to build your blog. So when I started my book blog, I didn't know anybody. I didn't know any other bloggers. I didn't interface with authors. Um, I didn't interface with publishers. And it took a really, really long time. And I know I've said that before, but that's really, really key. Um, because I think a lot of people start blogs and get really frustrated when it's not, um, you know, you don't have huge numbers right away. Or maybe you did get huge numbers because you got lucky, but you're not growing. It takes a lot of time and it takes a lot of conversations, a lot of networking, a lot of connections. People need to know you. And so it takes time for those relationships to develop. Um, so be patient and then follow through, you know, um, use your what you asked yourself in the beginning in terms of what you wanted your brand to stand for, use that as a litmus test as you think about the things that you want to take on, the opportunities that you want to say yes to, and the opportunities that you want to say no to. Um, and at that point, even for blogs like me that have been at it um, for a while now, I'm constantly looking at my analytics and my metrics and trying to figure out, you know, what are those telling me? How can I get better? How can I continue to grow? Um, and how can my brand continue to evolve? Because it's a brand journey, right? So you're evolving as you go. So those are some tips on getting started with your own blog. Um, second question, how do you organize your reading schedule? So the number one tool that I use is my own upcoming releases page. So if you go to vilmairis.com slash upcoming releases, um, you can see a list of my releases for the year. So when an author contacts me, with a book, say, hey, I have this book coming out, and if it's a fit with my blog, I will put it on my release calendar. Same thing with a publisher, same thing on if I get a book through the mail, and if it's a fit, I'll put it on my release calendar. And typically the way that I work is I have a, you know, my planner where I typically give myself, you know, two books a week and say these are the books that I'm, gonna, I'm going to read. And I'm typically scheduled out about six months ahead. And I give myself a little flexibility to um, shift things around. So again, if it's something that I want to read, I put it on my planner after I looked at my release calendar. Um, if it's a commitment I've made with a publisher, with an author, I put it on my planner. Um, but I really do start with my release calendar. Um, and that's really what I go to in terms of kind of looking at what I want to read or what I committed to. Of course, if you follow me on Instagram, you know that I get a lot of print arcs um, and books and I have my whole cart system that you guys might have seen. So um, if it's a book, again, that's on my upcoming releases or it's on my radar, 
I put it on the top of the cart, which is my to read pile. There's books that go in the middle of the cart and that is my to Instagram pile. So those are books that I might not be able to get to, but I want to photograph because of the fit um, with my blog. And then there are books that are just not a fit for me and those go in another box. And those are books that I typically donate to libraries um, here in my area. So that is how I organize myself. I start with my upcoming release calendar and I book myself out from there. Um, third question, can you give us any tips for writing better reviews? So everybody has their own writing style and their own voice and for me um, I always kind of think about what is the one thing that I want to convey about this book. So if, if I had a friend you know, with me and they're like, okay, so was this book good? You know, what is the one thing that I can tell them? And I try and tell them um, that one thing throughout the review. I do have like a particular way of structuring my reviews that I find um, is helpful and maybe people don't even realize it, but I, I write reviews to where the first paragraph, if you only want to read the first paragraph, it should give you an idea of what the review or what the book is all about. If you want a little bit more, you can continue um, with the next two or three paragraphs. And then the last paragraph just kind of summarizes it for you. And I try and keep my reviews as short as possible, um, but I am somewhat wordy sometimes. Um, but I do try and make them as kind of quickly scannable, snackable kind of reviews. Um, I try never to reveal a whole lot more than the synopsis. I don't ever put any spoilers in my review. Um, I use the synopsis kind of as a test, like did I reveal a whole lot more or is it within that spectrum? Um, so with that, that's kind of how I write my reviews. I think about the first sentence, first two sentences are what take me the longest. Um, I'm really thoughtful about how I start off and open a review. Um, and so just think about what you want your structure to be, um, what your voice is. For example, there are people who write reviews who are very excited when they communicate what they read and it gets other people excited. That is not my style. I'm a little bit more serious in how I convey what I thought about a book and I think that's okay. Um, so you won't often see a bunch of exclamation points in my reviews or a bunch of... Um, I try and really make it, um, you know, like if you're reading um, a review or as you can see from my reviews on USA Today or a professional review. So I just would say think about your voice, think about how you want to structure your reviews um, and then just go for it. I mean, we all have different styles and there's audiences for all styles. So don't worry too much about it. I think people really just want to know what you thought about the book and whether you thought it was good or not. Um, Fourth question, how do you encourage your kids to read? So <laughs> this is actually um, a little bit of a struggle. So um, my husband, Tony, and I are huge, huge readers. We have always been huge, huge readers. Um, since I was a kid, I, I I was a nerd. I That's how I wanted to spend my time. My kids are not that way. Um, my oldest, who is 12 and in middle school, he's a seventh grader, um, he has never gravitated towards fiction. He loves nonfiction. And for a good long while that I really struggled with that. I wanted him to read and fall in love with just the amazing um, books that are out there. I wanted him to read the Chronicles of Narnia. I mean, I fell in love with, for example, fantasy, a classic fantasy when I was a kid, um, was not interested. Um, we tried different, uh, tips um, that I had read online and nothing really worked and after a while you know I, I just kind of let him be. I, I, I did try and buy him different genres of books. I feel like you know especially with boys they really like comedy. Um, he's read things that are funny. He loves graphic novels but I do think that reading nonfiction, at least this is where I stand now, is okay too. And so I've let him kind of go with the nonfiction route. I mean, he's probably already smarter than I am. So um, I'm hoping that he falls in love with fiction later. Um, there have been some books that um, he has enjoyed and I have a middle grade section on my website now. So if you go to vilmairis.com slash middle grade, you can see some of those books there. But um, so my oldest, for the most part, is a nonfiction reader, and I think that's okay, and I think that counts. Um, 
my youngest is just a busy but he is a tornado of sorts so he is just all over the place and rarely sits down to just um, chill and read so for him um, I've done a few things um, there's for example the last book that we read is um, The Dreadful Tale of Prosper Writing by Alex Bracken and he really loved it at first but then he was kind of getting bored with it and so I decided to buy the book on Audible and listen to it um, on our way to school and so he got right back into the book and wanted to finish the book in print and so this kind of audible um, uh, you know strategy using audible and print um, kind of has helped us too but what I would say and I say this as a person who has gone through those similar struggles just give it time and, and, and let the kids be I think um, hopefully they will fall into reading um, but Sometimes it's just finding the right book, the right genre, the right time for them to be that captive audience. So that's how it is at my house. Um, and I would think that they would be encouraged just by seeing their dad and I read all the time because we read obviously every day. So, um, But they are their own little people and they have their own interests and I've got to respect that. So, um, Next question, what is your real job? So <laughs> I, I always say I have several jobs and I kind of do, right? Um, but in my real day job, I am a marketer. I've been in the marketing um, industry for over 20 years. Um, I've worked for ad agencies. I've worked at a university running um, their marketing operations. I have worked on um you know, web marketing, email marketing, um, a little bit of everything. So social media marketing, of course. Um, I used to run a global um, marketing team that ran the gamut, everything from kind of writing content to advertising to PR and events. Um, and now I am a, I help run um, a catalog operation in high tech, um, and that um, includes content and creative, and I'm also in charge of digital transformation and social media um, initiatives regarding catalog operations. So that is what I do during the day. It's a big job, um, but I really enjoy marketing. Um, and I have found over time, as much as I wanted to kind of keep my blog and my work separate, um, I am taking things that I've learned on the blogging side and, um, you know, incorporated them into my marketing activity at work and vice versa. So, um, that is my real job, um, or one of my my jobs, because blogging absolutely, totally and completely is the second job. And then as you guys know, I also write for USA Today. Um, sixth question, do you ever get intimidated doing things that you're not familiar with? Um, the answer is yes, but I have a very specific mantra um, around this, um, and I've had it since I was a teenager. Um, because I had a lot of insecurities growing up um, and I always used to tell myself and still do until this day if it's something that I'm scared of doing that is telling me that that is the right thing to do because that is where real learning is going to happen so um, if something scares me or if something makes me nervous then that's a yes for me let's you know that's a you've got to do it because that's where you're really going to learn and grow so um, I kind of flip that, you know, and, and really think about, you know, I think one of the uh, people that that asked me this question was talking about Orange Theory, you know, and they're scared to go in there and, and fail miserably. And I was too, I, you know, I wasn't in like the best shape when it came to running um, when I started, but um, what's the worst that can happen, right? I mean, you, you, you just need to try it. You need to go. You need to own your decision. And, you know, again, I, I really think it's helpful to kind of flip your mindset and think, okay, this is something that scares me. This is something that I have to do um, so that I can learn and grow as a person. Um, and so I always just kind of charge forward um, thinking about it that way. Um, what are your top five makeup must-haves? Um, this was really hard for me, um, and I think I chose six. But um, actually tomorrow, the same week that this post is going live, I have some more makeup must-haves that I'm sharing with you, and I will link it in the comments for this video. Um, okay, so the first makeup must-have, I think that if you are going to be putting foundation, 
my first makeup must have is using a primer. I use the Smashbox uh, Photo Finish Foundation Primer. It works really, really well for me. It's a pore minimizing primer, so especially kind of in these areas, it's really going to help the foundation glide on really smoothly. Just today, though, I went to Sephora to, um, to get a new foundation because I wanted something a little bit fuller coverage. And they um, tried a different primer on me, which I'm really, which I really liked. I'm going to try is the Make It Forever um, Skin Equalizer Radiant Primer. And um, this one did a really good job of cutting down some of the initial red that is natural to my skin. So I'm going to be trying this. But if you're going to do foundation, um, my first must have is for you to use some kind of primer. Now, for like every day, I don't always use foundation. Um, and so I use um, the Elta MD Tinted Moisturizer. I, in fact, I use, the, I use this even though, um, even on days where I wear foundation because it, it has SPF. Um, it has a SPF of 40 um, and it has a little bit of tint and it's just a great moisture and um, kind of on days when you don't want to put anything on it just gives your your skin a nice glow. So that is, this is one, so one or the other. Um, second is concealer. I love concealer and actually my favorite one is a Maybelline one. It's kind of a cult favorite. It's the Instant Age Rewind. Um, concealer this one is in fair and basically you just kind of put it on with this little sponge like this and it's really really great it's really really cheap um, it's what I use every day pretty much so um, this concealer is my second makeup must-have um, mascara is my third I love wearing mascara um, I used to have lash extensions and I miss them dearly but this mascara is the bomb. Um, it, it's really, really good, and I've yet to find a better mascara than this one. It's the Ciate, and I'm probably butchering that name, but it's a, a Ciate Triple Shot Mascara. It's only available online at Sephora, and I will link it below. It's amazing. Okay, what is my next makeup must-have? Oh, um, I said I had six, right? So... I love my own palette, eyeshadow palette. Um, I love using single shadows um, and collecting the colors that I like. So this is kind of the palette that I use the most. And um, I have a post that's coming up in the next week or two where I kind of tell you all the colors. They're mostly Makeup Geek and Anastasia, um, but that is kind of what I use um, most commonly every day. And then the next item is my um, Anastasia um, Dip Brow. I use this or the Benefit pencil, but I find that this is probably a little bit more precise. Um, I have to have my brows done. <coughs> Even if it's just a little bit, this is kind of the product that I use um, the most. And then lastly, and I swear by this, it's the Urban Decay um, All Nighter Setting Spray. So after you're done with your makeup, you just kind of spritz a little bit on and it doesn't... Uh, helps control your makeup and the oil throughout the day. It just sets everything really nicely and nothing kind of runs on your face or anything like that. I mean, it's really changed the way my makeup looks throughout the day. And at the end of the day, even like at eight o'clock, um, it looks really good still. So this is like an absolute must have um, for me. So those are my makeup must haves. Um, check out the post that um, is also live right now on a little bit longer of a list. Okay, and last question, because I know that this is kind of running long. Um, it's the question, number one question I get all the time when people meet me um, or sending me questions. Um, and it's basically, how do I balance it all? You've got this, you've got that. Um, how do you make it all work? And the first thing I want to say to that is my life is not perfect um, in any way. Um, I don't have all the answers. I don't know all the secrets. I don't have some kind of magical um, trick to it. Um, but I work really hard at trying to find balance. I don't know if that's one thing, like a thing that you can achieve. You know, I oh, I have found balance, but I work really hard at it. And I think, honestly, the number one thing is it's about time management. 
Um, so for me, I have a lot to do during the day and I think or I'm very thoughtful about how I spend my time. Um, I really try and focus on what's most important. Um, and so I think about that a lot and I, I yes, I have a, a bit of a schedule for myself and I'll talk about that. But I think that you have to ask yourself, what are the things that are most important to me? And for me, it's my family for sure. Um, it's my job because that is the way that I help support my family. And so I need to be serious um, and all there when I'm working. Uh, the blog is obviously very important to me. It's my heart. It's what I've worked at for years now. Um, and so I have to think of those things. And, and of course, there's also, you know, when I talk about my family, it's also my relationship with my husband. I'm actually a big romantic, no surprise there. Um, but I love spending time with him and making time to spend time with him. And so um, there are different things that I do to help get myself organized from like a general perspective, when on days when I'm feeling really, really overwhelmed, um, I do a brain dump. So I literally sit down with a blank sheet of paper and I dump all my worries and my to-dos on, on, on a list on paper. And typically you realize, number one, it's gonna um, unload you um, from that weight you feel upon, you know, on your shoulders. And it's going to put it all on paper and you're going to realize that it's very doable because once you have it all on paper, you can pull out your calendar and say, okay, today I'm going to do these three things, tomorrow I'm going to do those uh, three things, and you can break it up chunk by chunk and get it done, right? But it's out of your brain, off of your shoulders, and on paper to where you can do something about it. And I do that a lot. And in fact, I do it every Monday and every Friday um, as kind of a routine. So every Monday morning, I start off the week saying, what are the things that I need to get done this week? I put them down on a list. I try and divvy them up throughout the week. And on Friday, I take a look at that list and say, what did I get done? What didn't I get done? What do I need to get done this weekend? And what do I need to start thinking about for next week? So work on kind of doing these brain dumps. Um, and they're going to help tremendously. Um, another thing that I try really hard to do is to be in the moment. So, um, when I'm at work, I'm at work, my head is focused, I am not online. Um, a lot of my social media is, is scheduled and planned um, because I want to be completely present. Um, when the kids get home from school um, and we're hanging out or we're making dinner, I am all there and I am not on my computer and I don't have a book with me um, because I want to be able to to have them feel that I'm there and I'm looking at them and I'm making eye contact. Um, and so that's really important to me. Um, but overall, I mean, I, I work hard for what I want, you know, and, and the things that I don't have time for, I don't talk on the phone. Um, and some friends make fun of me for that. I don't like to talk on the phone. I don't have time for that unless I am multitasking and doing something. I don't waste a minute in my day. I honestly don't. Even when I go downstairs, for example, I won't come upstairs unless I have something in my hands that I need to put away. So I won't waste a trip upstairs or downstairs. Um, you know, I do things like um, I have a schedule for my blog. So on Sundays, Sundays are my big work day. And I spend a lot of time uh, working through my newsletter, working on my social media posts, finishing up any posts that I didn't get done throughout the week. Um, Sunday is my work day. My family knows that. And so I'm up early. Actually, I am up early every day. I'm up by six every day, even on Saturday and Sundays, because especially on the weekends when everybody else is asleep, I'm up getting started, um, working on the stuff that I need to work at. So by the time my kids are up and I'm making breakfast, I have time for them. Um, I typically, um, will not get any computer time Mondays. Monday nights or Tuesday nights, I try and read those nights. And then Wednesday night, I start working on a post, you know, with the new blog. Um, I have about six new pieces of content every week. And so I try and do two on Wednesday, two on Thursday, two on Friday. Typically it doesn't work out. It's typically one, 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 but that's what I work towards. So in other words, time management, how are you trying to organize your life? 
How do, how am I trying to organize my life? How do I break it up, you know, on a daily basis? Um, how do I focus on the things that are most important to me? Um, there are nights where I won't touch a book or a computer until everybody's asleep and I've spent time with my kids and I've spent time with my husband. Um, and yes, that means I'm up later than everybody else and I'm up earlier than everybody else, but those are the things that I've chosen to kind of take on in my life and I have to work for it. So there's no secret. Um, I just get it done and I, I, I don't think about it. I don't whine about it. Um, there are times when I am extra tired and I give myself that day, but um, really I just, I work hard. And, and if there's a secret, that's it. You know, work hard and manage your time as best uh, as best you can. So no magic, unfortunately, but hopefully that is a little bit helpful um, to you guys. Um, anyway, I think I'm going to close it off there. We've spent a lot of time already, but if you have any other questions that you guys want me to answer on anything, um, let me know. Send me an email, vilma at vilmairis.com. And until next time, I'll see you soon.